we're going to talk about when the spirit says go. Carl Sandburg was once asked what was the ugliest word in the English language. He thought for a long, long time, and then he replied, the ugliest word in the English language is exclusive. His comment reminded me of an article I read once, Cyberspace has a VIP lounge too, it was called. There was a large electronic bulletin board in New York City, a kind of electronic salon with over 2000 members who each paid $19.95 a month to be able to talk by modem about New York life. They called their talks conferences. Trouble, however, brewed online. It seems that a self-selected group of 40 members was quietly meeting via modem in their exclusive virtual nightclub, which they called xenophobia. It, they met between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. Xenophobia, which means a fear or hatred of strangers or foreigners, was established as a private conference. It was fitted with a software filter designed to keep uninvited people out. Unlike all the other conferences on this line, membership in xenophobia was exclusive and determined by invitation. Now we know private clubs are a fact of life, not only in Manhattan, but in most towns and cities in our country. In cyberspace, however, at least in the beginning, such exclusive communities were almost unknown. In fact, many people joined this bulletin board precisely because it offered a refuge from exclusivism of the F2F, meaning face-to-face -face world. Many members were startled and upset and hurt to find out this sort of thing existed in their electronic world too. And that once again, they were being left out. There's humor in all this, but underlying the humor is something incredibly sad. The sad truth is that the electronic world is not much different from the physical world and human beings have a penchant to exclude others. And exclusion, no matter where it exists, is ugly and destructive. Being cut, being excluded is a devastating experience. It separates us from our best view of ourselves, from other people, and sometimes even from God, the Lord and giver of life. What we see in the Bible, however, by way of Jesus Christ, is that God has nothing to do with our hierarchies and judgments about who is and who is not acceptable. God accepts all of us, imperfect, unfinished, just as we are. God turns no one away, God cuts no one, God excludes no one. Philip's story is the story of God and the way God works with us. It's the story of the indwelling guiding spirit who leads us in our daily walk. And it speaks to God's desire to include all people. The story begins in Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, where there were about 600,000 people living at the time. The feast of Pentecost has recently occurred the Holy Spirit had come down and was now living inside believers. There was an incredible amount of spiritual power and guidance available. The experience of the Holy Spirit was fresh and new. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, it filled Philip. Philip, a layperson, was not a famous preacher like Peter, who preached a grand sermon that converted 3,000 people in one day. Nor was he like the Apostle Paul, the missionary who spread the gospel of Jesus throughout his world. This story is about Philip and how God's indwelling power came down upon a layman. Philip was empowered to talk to people one-on-one -on -one about Jesus Christ and his love for all. When deacons were ordained for ministry with widows orphans, and poor people in the new church, Philip was chosen and ordained. If you were in need, you would go and talk to someone like Philip to see if the church could help you. At that time, most of the new Christians wanted to remain in Jerusalem along with the other Jewish Christians. They wanted to be in or near the temple every day. 
They did not want to go out into the countryside or the villages or other nations with the gospel, as they'd been told. These first Christians wanted to remain where they could huddle together and find safety in numbers. It took persecution to scatter them across the countryside. But before this happened, the inner voice of God said to Philip, get up and go, Philip, get up and go to Samaria. Samaria, he asked, why would I want to go to Samaria? The Jews and Samaritans hate each other. There's prejudice between us. We don't talk with each other. We don't walk with each other. We don't eat with each other. We don't meet with each other. We don't intermarry. So don't ask me to go. It's like the Jews and the Palestinians now, I suppose. God whispered to Philip again, get up and go, Philip. Go and to Samaria and preach the gospel of Jesus' love to the Samaritans. Tell them that God loves the Samaritans as much as he loves the Jews. Well, from the time he was a baby, Philip had been taught to avoid Samaritans. You don't walk with them. You don't talk with them. You don't eat with them. You don't meet with them. You don't intermarry. He was carefully taught by his parents, grandparents, teachers, by his friends and classmates, by his rabbis and his synagogue. He was taught that it was ordained by God for Jews to remain separate from Samaritans. But God said to Philip, get up and go, Philip, go to the Samaritans and preach the gospel of Jesus' love to all people. So Philip got up and went. He did what God asked him to do. But then God whispered into his ear a second time, get up and go to Gaza, he said. So Philip started down the road to Gaza, and there he encountered an Ethiopian eunuch. God said to Philip, go talk to that Ethiopian eunuch. Philip responded, God, don't you know that he's black? He's from the Sudan. We don't have anything to do with blacks. I'm a Jew converted to Christianity, but to talk to a black man about following Christ, that seems wrong. I've been carefully taught not to walk with blacks, not to talk with blacks, not to eat with blacks, not to meet with blacks, not to intermarry with blacks. My parents in synagogue taught me to exclude blacks. Then the inner voice of God said to him again, get up and go, Philip, and talk to that black Ethiopian who is a eunuch. Philip responded, God, don't you even read your Old Testament? Deuteronomy 23, 1 says eunuchs are forbidden to be part of the Jewish nation. Eunuchs are castrated persons. They've been made sexually impotent. The law says eunuchs are not allowed to be part of the kingdom of God. I have nothing to do with eunuchs. I have been carefully taught. I am not to talk with them or walk with them or eat with them or meet with them, much less marry with them. No way. Then the inner voice spoke again. Get up and go, Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch and talk to that black man in the chariot. Peter listened to the voice and he went over to the black man and asked him, what are you reading? The black man said he was reading from the Jewish Old Testament, Isaiah 53, that said that the lamb was to be led to the slaughter. Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? No, he said. Well, let me explain. The lamb is Jesus who was led to the slaughter. He was slaughtered on the cross so that all sins might be forgiven. And then he was raised from the dead on the third day. Peter explained, Philip explained his beliefs and his faith more fully to the stranger. And finally, the black man asks, what is to prevent me from being baptized? So he was baptized into Jesus Christ by Philip, who from his childhood was carefully taught to be well prejudiced against blacks and eunuchs. At the end of the story, the Bible says Philip went to Caesarea and he began a new ministry there. Now, if you keep on reading in Acts, after a while, you'll discover that Philip had four daughters. Can you imagine Philip, the father of four daughters, 
coming home to discover that all four of them have become prophets. Four women preachers. Philip had been carefully taught that women were property, that they were like farm animals that were meant to be obedient, that he could simply divorce them and be rid of them, that they should know their proper position in life and just accept it. Philip was taught that women were not even supposed to talk in church. But his daughters, all four of them, became prophets for Jesus Christ. Philip was now being taught carefully by the Holy Spirit that the role and position of women was meant to be in the kingdom of God. Despite his misgivings, Philip told the eunuch the good news of Jesus. He seems to have done so spontaneously. He didn't have time to prepare a well-crafted sermon, so he didn't get to speak from his notes. He just jumped right in, right there on the dusty road in the middle of nowhere. He just told the story of Jesus and how Jesus loves you. The name of the Ethiopian eunuch is not given, but we know he was secretary of the treasurer under Queen Candace of Ethiopia. And he had been to Jerusalem on a religious pilgrimage. It was on his way home that this high point of his trip occurred. He was cruising along in his chariot, reading aloud to himself from the book of Isaiah, when Philip overheard him and asked if he understood what the words were about. And the eunuch said he could use a little help on this passage. And that's when he learned about Jesus Christ. As a sheep led to the slaughter, or a lamb before its shearers is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken up from the earth. Who in the world was Isaiah talking about? The eunuch really wanted to know, and Philip said it was Jesus. Jesus was the one who was gentle as a sheep and innocent as a lamb. Jesus was the one who had been unjustly humiliated and slaughtered and had not so much as let out a peep to save himself. As for describing his generation, his time, all you could say was that Jesus belonged to all time and every generation because his life was not bound to the earth anymore. His life was everywhere and available to any one of us. Did you notice the author was careful to tell us that the road to Gaza was a wilderness road? It's a minor miracle that they spotted a pond by the side of the road, and the eunuch could ask, why shouldn't he be baptized? And that's when Philip obliged him. I think when that black and mutilated potentate bobbed back to the surface, he was so carried away he couldn't even speak. The sounds of his joy were like the sounds of a brook rattling over pebbles. It was clear that Philip's job was done, and Philip was whisked away by the Holy Spirit. Philip never saw the man again, but he couldn't forget him. He told the story to Luke, and Luke wrote it down for us. The question asked in the text is, do you understand the story in Isaiah 53 about the lamb being led to slaughter? But the question for us today is, do you understand the meaning of the story about Philip being sent to Samaria? The meaning of the story about his meeting a black person? The meaning of the story about the eunuch? The meaning of the story about the four daughters who became prophets? Do you understand the meaning of these stories? The storyline in the book of Acts is always a story about the Holy Spirit and how this Holy Spirit gets inside of us to guide us in our daily decisions. The Holy Spirit comes in through our ears and into our hearts, and we hear what God wants us to do. We say the Holy Spirit is indwelling, living in us. In the book of Acts, you find stories about men and women who were filled with the Holy Spirit. They're not like some of us who have a little bit of the Holy Spirit, like you might get in an hour on Sunday morning. No, these folks were filled with the Holy Spirit. Thereby, their hearts will listen. Their hearts listen to the indwelling Spirit of God whispering inside of them. 
being filled with the Holy Spirit, Philip was sensitive to the Spirit's voice. The voice said, get up and go, Philip, go to Samaria. Philip, go to Gaza. Philip, go to the black man. Philip, go to the eunuch. Philip, go home to your four daughters who are now prophets. Philip was given specific directions from God. It was not just his conscience. It was probably not an angel with wings or an auditory voice or a dream or a nightmare. It was the inner guiding voice of God, the spirit of Jesus Christ. We, like Philip, can listen to the inner guiding voice as God talks with us about our marriages, our kids, our financial transactions, our relationships, our ministries. And we can learn to listen. Listen to the voice of God inside us as we make our daily choices. So what else do we learn from this story about Philip today? What is this stuff about the black eunuch? about going to Samaria, about four daughters who became prophets. The meaning of the text is quite clear. When the power of God gets inside us and fills us, it eliminates our prejudices. We've all been programmed to be exclusive, nationally, racially, sexually, religiously. God's gospel for today is that people of all races, people of all nations, People of all sexualities and people of all religions are loved by God. God is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God is absolutely inclusive in his love. Now, if you have a little bit of the Holy Spirit, like you get during Sunday morning worship, then go ahead and hold on to your prejudices. Go ahead and be prejudiced against people who are not like you. But if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're filled with the spirit of Jesus' love, there's no longer any room in your heart for prejudice. The love in your heart can expand, expand to include all kinds of people from all kinds of places, all kinds of races and religions and sexualities, all the people who are loved by God the Father. When the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Jesus' love fills your heart, there's no longer any room for prejudice. But there's one more thing about Philip. We may be led into relationships with people who do not know Jesus Christ. The Spirit may guide us to share our faith with strangers. Even if we're not like Peter, the gifted preacher, or Paul, the great missionary. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus' love, we're called to get up and go to others to share our faith in Christ one-on-one. -on -one. We're called to get up and go. The stories about Philip, the deacon who cares for poor people in the church. Philip goes when the spirit says go, and he has an amazing encounter with someone he would never have chosen to meet, the Ethiopian eunuch. Peter witnesses to the minister of the treasury in the queen's court of Ethiopia. He witnesses to a man who has the ear of people in power, to a man who has the opportunity to put his faith in action in places where Philip will never go. So here's what I think. What every congregation needs is a lot of folks like Philip. We may not be preachers like Peter or missionaries like Paul, but we can share our faith one-on-one -on -one like Philip. We need people who listen for the Spirit's guidance. We need people who share their faith, faith easily with others. We need disciples who can include all kinds of people in their relationships. We need believers who can open their mouths and tell the story of Jesus outside the walls of the church. We need you and me to be more like Philip so we can transform the spiritual life of our community. Thanks be to God for Christ who saves us and the spirit who fills us and sends us. And God bless the Phillips in our midst. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for those who ask important questions, 
and for those who travel alongside as we seek life-giving answers. Center us when everything around us is swirling. Focus us when we find our lives difficult. Connect us when we feel cut off. Renew us when old categories no longer hold. Baptize us with your spirit that we may be fresh and free. In the name of the one who is our center, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is 150.